at this time, uh, let us open up our worship service. We have come into this house to magnify the Lord and worship Him. Oh, we have come into this house to magnify the Lord and worship Him. And we have come Coming to this house to magnify the Lord and worship Christ the Lord. Oh, worship Him. Oh, worship Christ the Lord. And so forget about yourself and magnify. Magnify the Lord and worship Him. Oh, and so forget about yourself and magnify the Lord and worship Him. And so forget about yourself and magnify the Lord. And worship Christ the Lord. Oh, worship Him. Oh, worship Christ the Lord. Good morning, church. How's everyone doing today? We're here to worship God. You know, a funny thing happened this morning. We came in, and um, it was a squirrel running around being squirrely, right? And he was, um, you know, jumped out of the tree onto the, uh, onto the, the power lines, right? And uh, we looked down on the ground. We saw a fried squirrel down there today. And we didn't have any lights or anything. So they came out, and they um, got everything going for us. And uh, I just started to think about, you know, even though um, technology, we become so dependent on it, and uh, it's when it's disrupted that we begin to realize how, I don't want to say unnecessary, but not critical uh, to us accomplishing what God wants us to accomplish. There are certain times in history where there's been persecutions. Uh, there have been situations that we would, through the natural eye, begin to see as a deterrent to our ability to worship God and to spread the good news of Christ. But God providentially can use that very thing uh, that Satan meant to be a hindrance. He can use it to be a help. So we uh, will worship God today in spite of all the different things that are going on contrary uh, to our being able to worship today. And amen. I believe that. And so today, as we get ready to worship, I'm going to ask that we focus our minds on this thought. Uh, our God is the most high God. He is worthy of all of our glory. He is worthy of all of our praise, honor, and adoration. So as we engage in worship today, we are choosing as a devotional theme, all glory to the most high God. Do you guys believe that? Can you stand and say that out loud? All glory, All glory. to the Most High God. The most high God. Amen. Now, you, while you're standing, I'd like for you to engage with me in our responsive reading. It's going to be a call response. I will do the call, and then the congregation will come in and respond. Are you ready for that? Yes. Amen. Almighty Most High God, faithful. High. Let's, let's do that again. Yes. Let me give the instructions once, one more time. I'm going to do the call where it says leader, ain't but one leader, okay? And that's not a play on words, okay? It's just how it is. I'm going to lead us, and then the congregation will chime in where it says congregation. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. amen. <laughs> Almighty Most High God, faithful through the ages. Almighty Most High God. 
Change my heart, O oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God. May I be like you. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we come before you acknowledging that you are glorious. Acknowledging that you are holy. You are indeed the most high God. And as we ascribe to you honor, glory, majesty, we hope and pray that even as we uh, come together as your body, the church, filled with all the flaws that we come with, all the baggage that we have, we understand that we are not perfect, but you have made us perfect in the beloved. And therefore, you choose to see us uh, not in all of our flaws and imperfection, but in the splendor and glory of your son, Jesus. So we are grateful for that, for we know that without you, we are nothing. With you in our lives, all things are possible. So as we praise you today, and as we say thank you, Lord, uh, for blessing us, uh, for being our help in time of need, we magnify you, we worship you, and we say all glory to the most high God. So you're worthy to be praised, and as we worship today, we pray that our hearts are lining up with you in such a way that the very uh, words of our mouth and meditations of our heart be acceptable in your sight. For you are indeed our Lord, our strength, our strong tower, as well as our Redeemer, our Savior, our Comforter, and Keeper of our soul. For in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. I'm going to ask that you remain standing for just a few moments as our devotional team or our devotional leader comes and, de and directs our hearts in, in praise and worship today. Good morning once again, church. Page 37. Page 37 in our hymn books. Page 37 in our green and white folders. If you have it, let us together sing. Watch ye there, for you know not the day when the Lord shall call your soul away. You labor striving for the right, and then you shall wear a golden crown. And you know that you shall wear a crown. Yes, you shall wear a crown. And you know that. When the trumpet sound, yes, when the trumpet sound, you shall wear a crown. Yes, you shall wear a crown, and you know that you shall wear a golden crown. And be not like those foolish virgins then, for he is coming, and you know not when. Keep your lance all trimmed and burning bright, and you shall wear a golden crown, and you know that you shall wear a crown. Yes, you shall wear a crown, and you know that when the trumpet sound, yes, when the trumpet sound, you shall wear a crown. Yes, you shall wear a crown. And you know that you shall wear a golden crown. And if at last you hold out to the end, Jesus is an everlasting friend. If you stay within the church he found, then you shall wear a golden crown. And and you know that you shall wear a crown. Yes, you shall wear a crown. And you know that when the trumpet sound, yes, when the trumpet sound, you shall wear a crown. Yes, you shall wear a crown. And you know that you shall wear a golden crown. And you know that you shall wear a crown. Yes, you shall shall wear a crown. And you know that when the trumpet sound, yes, when the trumpet sound, you shall wear a crown. Yes, you shall wear a crown. And you know that you shall wear a golden crown. 
Woke up this morning, page number 32, the green and white folder. If you haven't, let us together sing. I woke up this morning with my mind, and you know it was stay on oh, Jesus. Yes, I woke up this morning with my mind, and you know it was stay on the Lord. Yes, I woke up this morning with my, and you know it was still on oh, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Church, now I'm singing. And pray, yeah, with my mind, and you know it was still on oh, Jesus. Yes, I'm singing and pray, yeah, with my, and you know it was still on the Lord. Yes, I'm singing, praying with my, and you know it was still on oh, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Church now. I'm walking and talking with my, and you know it was still on oh, Jesus. Yes, I'm walking and talking with my, and you know it was still on the Lord. Yes, I'm walking and talking with my, and you know it was still on oh, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Church now, I woke up this morning with my, and you know it was still on oh, Jesus. Yes, I woke up this morning with my, and you know it was still on the Lord. Yes, I woke up this morning with my, and you know it was still on oh, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. As we prepare our hearts and our minds for the Lord's Supper, which we call communion, let us notice page number 30 in the green and white folder. Thank you, Lord. We have so much to be thankful for. Page number 30. If you have it, let us together sing. Thank you, Lord. I want to thank you, Lord. I want to thank you, Lord. And I just want to thank you, Lord. I want to thank you, Lord. I want to thank you, Lord. I want to thank you, Lord. And I just want to thank you, Lord, because you've been so good. We know you've been so good. And we know you've been so good. And I just want to thank you, Lord. Good morning, church. This is the part of the service where we recognize the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. A symbolically take of his body and of his blood. We read in Acts 27, upon the first day of the week, the disciples came together for the purpose of breaking bread. I'll be reading from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 11, verse 23 through verse 29. And it reads, For I received of the Lord, that which also are delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, 
the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when given thanks, he broke and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup. When he stopped saying, This cup is a New Testament, my blood, this you do oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For though you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, who should eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily should be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Let's pray. <clears throat> Our dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, Heavenly Father, come thank you, Heavenly Father, for the bread to represent your broken body, dear Lord. <clears throat> we come thank you for the cup to represent the blood you shed for us, Heavenly Father. May we take time, Heavenly Father, to focus and meditate on the sacrifice you made for us, dear Lord. Because through our sacrifice, we have right to the tree of life. And we have that life, and we have that life so much more abundantly. These blessings we are truly grateful and thankful for, dear Lord, for all the blessings you bestowed upon us. Amen. Let us break bread together on our knees. Let us break bread together on our knees. And when I fall on my knees with my face to the rising sun, Oh, Lord, have mercy on me, yes, on our knees. <clears throat> Was everyone served? Mm. This now brings to the portion of the service where we're commanded to give. We also refer to the book of Second Corinthians. Chapter eight, chapter nine, verse six and verse seven, and it reads, "But this I say, <clears throat> he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he that soweth bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Every man according to as he pur purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver." Let's pray. A dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, Heavenly Father, I come thank for this opportunity, Heavenly Father, to give a little bit back, Heavenly Father. But we know it all belongs to you, Heavenly Father. But we just thank for this opportunity. And may this collection be used for the furtherment of your spiritual kingdom, Heavenly Father, in this community and elsewhere. These blessings we are truly grateful for, Heavenly Father, and all our blessings. Amen. If you have a contribution, uh, raise your hand and the brothers will uh, get them, uh, retrieve them for you, from you. Okay. Let's notice page 262 in our red handbooks, 262. Let us sing. Jesus, my heavenly king, loves me, I know. Praises to him I sing, onward I go. Closely to him I cling, blessings still flow. For I love my Savior too, and don't you know that I love my Savior, and he loves me too. Yes, he loves me too, and I seek his favor in everything I do. Yes, walking with him each day, love life does shine, and I'm doing his will always, never repine. And I'm kneeling to him, I pray, thy will, not mine, for I love my Savior too. And don't you know that I love my Savior, and he loves me. Me too, yes, he loves me too, and I seek his favor in everything I do. Yes, I'm happy to serve my friend.
and leaned on his arm. And rapture will never end, nothing alarm. And yes, the voices will sweetly blend under his charm. For I love my Savior too. And don't you know that I love my Savior and he loves me too. Yes, he loves me too. And I seek his favor in everything I do. And don't you know that I love my Savior and he loves me too. Yes, he loves me too. And I seek his favor in everything I do. Before the scripture reading and prayer, let us notice page 343. 343. Have it? Let us together sing. Well, it won't be very long till this short life shall end. And it won't be very long until Jesus shall descend. And then the dead in Christ from beds of clay shall rise to meet the Lord and King up yonder in the sky. Oh, Lord, it won't be very long. It won't be very long until my Jesus shall appear. Well, that day is drawing near, so you get ready then to meet the ransom throng. Uh, get ready for that day. It won't be very long. It won't be very long till here it cease to roam. And it won't be very long till all the saints get home. And then with a smiling face. We'll walk the streets of gold and sing the Savior's praise where saints are never old. Oh, Lord, it won't be very long. It won't be very long until my Jesus shall appear. Well, that day is drawing near. Will you get ready then to meet the ransom throng? Get ready for that day. It it won't be very long, uh, it won't be very long, until earth shells pass away. It won't be very long, until uh, works of men decay. But Jesus has prepared a happy dwelling place for all who look above and trust his matchless. Oh Lord, it won't be very long, uh, it won't won't be very long until my Jesus shall appear. Well, that day is drawing near. Uh, will you get ready then uh, to meet the ransom throng? Uh, get ready for that day. Uh, it won't be very long. Oh, Lord, it won't be very long. Uh, it won't be very long until my Jesus shall appear. Well, that that day is drawing near. Oh, will you be ready then to meet the ransom throng? Uh, get ready for that day. Uh, it won't be very long. Good morning, church. Good morning. If you're able to, please stand for the reading of the scripture. Today's scripture will be coming from Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 8. And it reads, And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women 
committed them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere, preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them. And many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. This concludes the reading of the scripture. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I'd like to thank you for waking us up this morning. We thank you for giving us the opportunity today to assemble and to be more involved in your word and learn what it means to become better Christians. We just ask that you watch over us as we proceed throughout our service and that you crown our speaker with knowledge. We ask all these things in your son's name, in Jesus' name, amen. This is notice page number five. Page number five in our green and white folders. I know somebody's listening. If you have it, let us together sing. Though a pilgrim, a stranger, a beggar I be, as here I go traveling on. Though the dearest of friends will not listen to me and chide me for trusting God's Son. Though the world in its folly, its sin and its shame neglectfully turns me away, I still have my Savior. Oh, praise his sweet name, and he hears everything that I say. And I know somebody's listening, and he hears everything. And I know somebody answers every prayer I secretly pray. And I know somebody loves me. And I never turn me away. Tis Jesus the Savior on Mount Calvary, and He hears everything that I say. And through the troubles and trials and darkest of night, He speaks and I hear His kind voice. Through the darkness, He giveth me comfort and light. He keeps me in him I rejoice. What more could I ask when the shadows grow dim and kindred and loved ones betray? Hey, oh, no, 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 cherished in Jesus, the friend who hears everything that I say. And I know somebody's listening and he hears everything. And I know somebody loves me. Any prayer that I secretly, secretly pray. And I know somebody loves me. And will never turn me away. It is Jesus the Savior on Mount Calvary. And he hears everything that I say. Let us notice page number 33 in our green and white photos. Page number 33. If you have it, let us together sing. When we reach that city of the new Jerusalem, we're going to sing, we're going to sing by and by. And yes, how the ransom singers will together lift at him. Yes, we're going to sing, we're going to sing by and by. And oh, 
Oh, what joy when we get home. Yes, we're going to find rest, rest beneath that cloudless dawn. We're singing now in that land where saints will never die. Yes, we're going to sing. We're going to sing by and by. Yes, in that mighty chorus, voices will so sweetly sing. Yes, we're going to sing. We're going to sing by and by. Yes, a gone will be our sadness. Pleasure there will never end. Yes, we're going to sing. We're going to sing by and by. And oh, what joy when we get home. Yes, we're going to find rest. Yeah. Rest beneath that cloudless dawn. We're singing now in that land where saints will never die. Yes, we're going to sing. We're going to sing by and by. Uh, yes, so victory and love will be our everlasting theme. Yes, we're going to sing. We're going to sing by and by. Uh, yes, praising our Redeemer there beside the crystal stream. Yes, we're going to sing. We're going to sing by and by. And oh, what joy when we get home. Yes, we're going to find rest, rest beneath that cloudless dawn. We're singing now in that land where saints will never die. Yes, we're going to sing. We're going to sing by and by. And oh, what joy when we get home. Yes, we're going to find rest, rest beneath that cloudless dawn. We're singing now in that land where saints will never die. Yes, we're going to sing. Hallelujah. We're going to sing Hallelujah. by and by. Let us notice page 668 in our rare books before the speaker of the hour. Let us notice page 668. Help me out with this one. Now, if you have it, let us take it the same. There is beyond the azure blue a God concealed from human sight. He tinted skies with heavenly hue and framed the world with his great might. There is a God, he is alive. In him we live and we survive. From the star God created man, he is our God, the great I am. There was a long, long time ago a God whose voice the prophets heard. And he is the God that we should know, who speaks from his inspired. Don't you know there is a God? He is alive. In him we live and we survive. From the star God created man. He is our God, the great I am. Our God, who sun upon a tree, alive, was willing there to give that he from sin might set men free and evermore with him could live. Don't you know there is a God? He is 
is a lie. In him we live and we survive. From the star God created man, he is our God, the great I am, great I am, there is a God, and he is a in him we live and we survive from the star God a created man and he And he is alive, in him we live, and we survive. church say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. From whom all blessings flow. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning, everyone who's here today. And those who are tuning in today, we want to let you know that we appreciate so very much uh, your presence, be it presently or in the present flesh or virtually. It doesn't matter. We're glad that you're here. We hope and pray that something will be said to cause you to think along your way as it relates to life and even the abundant life that is promised and offered and made available through Jesus Christ, our Lord. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Acts uh, today. I don't know what to call it. Do I call it Acts of the Apostles? Acts of the Holy Spirit, which is perhaps more appropriately, but perhaps even more germane to our lesson today. I want to call it Acts of the Scattered Church. The Acts of the Scattered Church. And the reason why this is important because, is because uh, of the times in which we live. Just look around. Yeah. Look around right now. And even as we speak, uh, there is turmoil, uh, violence, uh, hatred, uh, vitriol. I guess it's Sunday. Because <laughs> that's an everyday thing. Every day there's something going on. There's so much consternation, dismay, and terror right. running rampant throughout the land. Yeah. And so as you look at today, even in the Middle East, as though there hadn't already been skirmishes all over the world, there's a lot of skirmishes right here. Right. Oh, yes. There's a lot of divisiveness, and because of that uh, division, there's a lot of hatred and uh, propaganda and a lot of uh, 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 negative smear campaigns going on, all designed to bring division, to weaken us, uh, to bring us to our knees. What about the church? What about the church? It's often been said when the world is at her worst, the church has to be at her best. Yeah. 
because we have to be the light, the guiding light. Well, the question becomes today, if we look at this text and the, the, the surrounding context that gave breath to this passage today, we have to ask ourselves a very, very fundamental question. Uh, is this a, uh, a, a prophetic warning? A prophetic warning to us as believers as it relates to our role and responsibility. You see, this passage uh, takes up uh, where chapter 7 left off. You know, when you look at the, when you read the Word of God, sometimes you have to ignore the fact that there are chapter breaks. Sure. You lose continuity with the chapter breaks, but it was not originally written in book, chapter, and verse. Uh, so notice, as you look at, this is simply a continuation of what had been transpiring throughout the whole book of Acts, beginning when Jesus gave a great, great commission to his uh, disciples. He said, and you shall be my witnesses. Okay? He said, you shall be my witnesses. He began to, to outline the, the basic Holy Spirit strategy for world domination by the church. He began to give us the blueprint of how we are to take his message to the masses. He said, beginning where? In Jerusalem. And then in Judea, and then in Samaria, and then to the uttermost part of the earth. In other words, there should be no stone unturned. You know, every, as we traverse uh, this terrain, we must make sure that we're always speaking in his name. And so therefore, we have to ask the question. Uh, as we see Stephen's message in Acts chapter 7, you know what happened in Acts chapter 7. Uh, in Acts chapter 7, um, Stephen outlined and laid forth a brilliant treatise uh, for the veracity of Christianity. He helped us understand the fullness of God's purpose and design culminating in Jesus coming to the world, living amongst us, and then giving himself sacrificially that we may have life. And he began to articulate uh, uh, from a very prophetic uh, uh, standpoint as he began to go back in the Old Testament and bring out those old uh, patriarchal heroes uh, like David, etc., yeah. letting them know that Jesus is indeed the Christ, yeah. the Son of God. He's the Savior of the world. Yeah. And all the things that transpired, even by the hands of wicked men, uh, uh, were a part of Satan's scheme to annihilate the church. But it was God's divine providential care and wisdom that resulted in Christ and Christianity being proclaimed throughout the world. Yes, that's right. Oh, if Satan only knew. <laughs> he would have made sure that Jesus would have never gone to the cross. Right. Jesus would have still been collecting Social Security. Yeah, he, he, didn't want, he didn't want to see Jesus die on the cross. Right. Yeah, because that meant the crushing of Satan's head. Right. It meant the victory that we have in Jesus Christ. It meant glory and salvation to all of us. Right. Satan, you don't win. Even though he said he had accomplished a great feat by putting Jesus on the cross. That's just what you didn't want him to be. For Jesus said, if I be lifted up, <laughs> I draw all men unto me. As I vacillate between acts of the apostles and acts of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so it's the Holy Spirit. Um, the promised comforter. Who now comes on the scene. In, in grand, spectacular fashion. Ushering in the birth. Uh -huh, or the creation. Or yes, even the inauguration of the church. And, and so as we see that, I want to pose this because as um, this prophetic warning of present day persecution on the horizon, don't get me wrong when I say that. Troublesome times are here. And as things escalate and elevate, it won't be something that we look at on the news about. It can be stuff happening in your backyard and even knocking at your door. You see, Stephen's message helps us to understand uh, in what way are we prepared to respond 
to the challenges of our faith? In what ways are you prepared to respond to the challenges of your faith? You see, Stephen's message was God's final invitation to Israel. If Israel rejected the message, God would then turn uh, to the Gentiles uh, to become the root and the ground for his church. In fact, Israel did reject the message. They rejected the message. And not only did they reject the message, that they said, we must destroy the messenger. We have to stomp out and stamp out uh, this message and this heretical, cultic movement that has the audacity to say that Jesus was the Son of God. And so therefore, in Acts chapter 7, we see how they violently gnash themselves upon Stephen, uh, gnashing their teeth and, and taking him and, 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 and murdering him. To say stone him, maybe we may kind of, you know, get caught in the colloquialisms and, and you know, they, they killed him, yeah. murdered him, right. took him out and took big boulders and rocks and, and just hurled him at his head, just violently killed him yeah. in this attempt uh, to utterly destroy and step out the church. However, <laughs> however, God had another plan. However, even in the midst of all of that hatred, however, see, their, their verdict was against the church, but God overruled their verdict. Yes. God said, I'm overruling your pronouncement of stamping out any annihilation of the church. I'm going to overrule in this thing. And notice what he does. He used the very uh, persecution that they used as a means to stamp out the church. He used that same persecution as a means of scattering the church all across the world. Right. And you know, it's like a, if, if, if someone is, is cooking and you're frying some food, right? And, and you get a grease fire. And in your panic, first thing you want to do Brother, you must keep him out of the kitchen. <laughs> keep that brother out of the kitchen. First thing you want to do is pour water on it, right? And the very water that normally would put out the fire has now spread the fire. See, when, 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 when Satan was using those antagonistic Jews uh, to stamp out Christianity, they took water and poured it on a, on a grease fire. And then instead of putting the fire out, they fanned the flame all over the world. Yeah. Right. Yes. <laughs> and so today I want, to, I want to take that, that historical fact, and I want to use it to show how God fulfilled uh, the instructions of Jesus. So Jesus said in Matthew 28, he said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. He said, go ye therefore uh, and, and teach all nations or make disciples, okay? He said, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Right. Yeah, he said, he said, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And when you do that, if, if, if you do that, and when you do that, don't worry about nothing. <laughs> he said, Lord, I'll be with you always, even until the end of the age. I'm going to be there. That's a conditional promise. Oh, uh, yes, a conditional promise. He said, go and do what I tell you to do. And when you do that, I will be with you. I'm going to give you the courage, the backbone and the spine, the gumption to stand up and speak. Don't even worry about being articulate. Don't worry about what you're going to say. Just go there and be my representative. I give you the words. I got you. You believe that? You believe that God says, if you, if you do what I ask you to do, I'm going to promise to do what I told you I was going to do? Yes, How many of you believe that? Can you take him at his word? Is he, is he right and tried and true? <laughs> well, well, there's a purpose for this lesson today. There's a purpose for this thing. And, and, and it's simply, I want to show uh, that we have been given the biblical blueprint. Uh, for kingdom expansion. It's all about the kingdom, right? 
It's not about us, you know, you know, playing a lot of church games. It's all about the kingdom of God being advanced and expanded. Understand that. And, and so, therefore, um, we have been given the blueprint in Ephesians chapter 4. That God has given some uh, 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 apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastor teachers all for the perfecting or for the equipping of the saints. For, or in order that the saints can engage in the work of service. That sounds like theory, but in Acts chapter 8, we see the practicum. We see how this thing actually takes place. See, when God says do a thing, he's going to make sure that you do a thing. Is that right? What's our vision statement? Glorifying God through serving others. Okay, making every member a minister and taking his message to the masses. So how do we make that come into a reality? How do we bring that to fruition? Well, brother said, put it into action. I get it. Notice in Acts chapter, Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8, well, 1 through 8. They begin to make, have a query. They ask Jesus, you know, when's the kingdom going to come? And you, when are you going to set all things in order? You know, when are you going to really start, you know, restoring, you know, Israel to its, her, her splendor and, and, and grandeur, back to good, like the good old days? And he said, don't even worry about that. He said, but you will be my witnesses. Okay? He said, not based on your own prowess or your own intellect or your own cunning guy or ingenuity. No, 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 no. He said, for when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Yes, See, we, we try to get ahead of our skis. And we want to do things based on Gino, Brother Merriweather, and all that kind of nonsense. No, he said, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And this is important. I want you to wait until you get your marching orders. Sometimes we, we, we want <laughs> sometimes you don't want to go where you're supposed to go, and we're not supposed to go. That's where you want to rip and run. <laughs> so he said, this is going to happen, you know, again, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the most part of the world. He said, this is how it's going to happen. Okay? But notice, as the early church began to take root, they were real comfortable, warm and cozy. Warm and fuzzy, right there in Jerusalem. Okay? Some great things were happening. The, 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 the church uh, had been established and it was now growing and uh, they were dealing with issues pertaining to the maturation of the body and all those different things. But hey, don't forget what I told you to do now. We have to take this blueprint to heart and adhere to Ephesians 4 until every member uh, is a minister and the masses hear the message. And so that's why I wanted to take this as a theme, the acts of the scattered church. The acts of the scattered church. Now, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to that passage. Again, the eighth chapter of the book of Acts. And as we go there, I'm not going to give a lot of background on the book of Acts. We've already been through that. You've been in enough Sunday school classes to know that Luke was the, pen, the penner of this. It's a, a, a really a continuation of Luke, of the gospel of Luke. Yes. And written to the same person, most excellent Theophilus, who was a Gentile, who converted to Christianity. And, and, and Luke wanted to make sure he had... You know, he had his, his, that he was anchored in the faith. Yeah. He wanted to make sure he was anchored in the faith. And he said, I am taking it upon myself to explore, you know, and, and give a, a comprehensive narrative that you may understand and know for certainty all the things that you have been taught. Okay? He said, I want to give you a good uh, apologetic so you understand and know the faith, the very tenets of the faith the historicity of the church, and then the prophetic fulfillment of God's uh, eternal plan of salvation through the church. Now, I, I want to say 
that, um, again, the death of Stephen served as a fan of the flame for Christianity throughout the world, the known world. Uh, it was a grassroots movement. Understand that. It was a grassroots movement uh, that turned the world upside down. Now, the Bible says, and I'm on my way there. Sometimes I tell you guys to turn there and you have to get there and wait for me to finally get there. Uh, but I'm on my way. In Acts the eighth chapter, it says, it introduces this character that we are going to see him come out of obscurity into prominence. It says, and Saul, and Saul was consenting unto his death, being Stephen. Remember, we talked about that, right? Acts chapter 7. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout, throughout the regions of Judea, uh-oh, and Samaria, except the apostles. So the apostles stayed in Jerusalem, while the rest of those members, they scattered. Mm. And it says, and devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. I want to stop right there because I want to begin giving you this. I want to give you the, the fury of personal persecution. The fury. See, right now there's a lot of uh, saber rattling in this world. There's a lot of... Um, if we was on the streets, you know, folks selling wolf tickets. Is that right? Yeah. People are boasting of what I'm going to do to you. Yeah. You better not cross this land or you're going to have to deal with me. You know, this country is telling this country, other country, you better not mess with that country. Because if you mess with that country, you messing with me. Yeah. And this is, we, we hear the rumbling all over the world over this stuff. Well... Notice, this fiery persecution was launched against the church by the religious leaders of the Jews, but it was Saul who acted as the point person. It was Saul who was the one who was really, really giving voice to this opposition against the church. You know, every now and then there's something that's, you know, there's, there's a, a wave that's going on, and there has to be someone who begins to really be the, the, the point person who begins to dole out all the rhetoric and all the, the different uh, insinuations and, and all that, those little, what do they call them? They call them, uh, um, what kind of words? Um, I guess not buzzwords, but they begin to give certain key words uh, that incite and inflame and stir up and create mob mentality. Say it again. Dog was yeah, them. <laughs> See, the only thing dog was only dogs could hear. Now they're getting so bad they don't need to. They have a, a megaphone. Yes, you know the, the thing that they used to uh, cloak in soliloquy and 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 and, and different phrasings. Now it's being just boldly just in your face. That's what we're dealing with. And so there was a man named Saul who was the one who was, the Bible says he was the one, he was the point person. He was the one, the Bible says, was consenting. The idea of consenting, uh, he, he consented to, he gave approval. He was the one, he was the one giving full-throated support to this thing. It, was, it goes on to say that he was breathing, breathing threatenings, you know, against the church. He even said himself that he was very injurious to the church. He was trying to stamp it out. He was trying to make the church a scorched earth. He was trying to annihilate the church. He was trying to stamp it out. Kill it for it grow. That was his whole mission. So not only uh, was he consenting or give approval or giving a nod, okay, to the killing of Stephen, uh, but he was even more zealous than that. He led the persecution. He was the one who uh, secured authority uh, from the powers that be to be able to go and arrest them wherever he found them. Yeah. Can you imagine three o'clock in the morning someone knocking on your door 
and then kicking your door in because they heard you saying a good word about Jesus, dragging you in the streets, dragging you and your family in the streets to be uh, 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 tried and found guilty of blasphemy, putting folk to death. Are you sure you're a Christian? Yeah. Are you a man or a mouse? Say, go ahead, squeak up. <laughs> Let me know where you are. The persecution was launched quickly. Notice the progression from, from Acts chapter 7 into Acts chapter 8. The very day. Uh, when, 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 uh, when, uh, when, uh, when Stephen was killed, that was just the beginning. Then they began to look around, well, are you one? Are you one? And they began to round folk up. They began to, to uh, it, spread, it was launched quickly. The same day of Stephen's death, they didn't stop there. It was inflamed and, and they became, became more and more, but it was launched quickly. This, this persecution was launched quickly uh, and just as quick it was, as it was, it was just as violent. Violent. Yes. Violent. Yes. People being disenfranchised is that's a light word. Folk was losing their lives. Yes. Folk were running, trying to get away. Yes. Notice the persecution, it scattered the church. People had to run for cover. People had to duck and dodge and get up out of town. Yeah, yeah. All of those things were happening. Can you imagine? What would happen if that kind of persecution broke out against us today? How will you deal with that? I want to make this thing plain. See, sometimes we get so comfortable. We get comfortable in this peacetime religion. Even though Christians are supposed to be the most militant group on the face of the earth. We have this peacetime Christianity. Hot tub religion. These folk had people trying to kill them. We leave the church because somebody didn't say good morning. Have it your way, religion. The persecution was violently launched. And it resulted in them being scattered all over the world. They were scattered physically, but they were not scattered spiritually. Yeah. Hey, stay with me. Sometimes it's dark before the dawn. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They were scattered physically, but they began to be stronger spiritually. It's amazing how that happens sometimes. Sometimes you need a, a trial or two to come into your life. To give you some girth, to give you uh, some stick to itiveness, to give you uh, a reason, you know, for understanding what the mission and vision of the church really is. Sometimes you, you don't need no lukewarm, have it your way Christianity. See, when the lights went out today, we, we oh, ooh, what are we gonna do? You know what I did? I went to my office in the dark and just started praying. <laughs> I, I wasn't even worried. We'd already called Fred Cooper. He had already called the, the place. <laughs> Early for most of you, you hadn't even got here. <laughs> yeah, they was on their way. Help was on the way. Right. All we needed to do was just chillax. Mm -hmm. Just one in, just go ahead and <laughs> just open up the blinds. <laughs> yeah, let the sun on in. Yeah, yeah. Just went in and just start praying, just collecting my thoughts. God's got this. And, and let me just give this to you. This is not in my notes, but many times we fret over stuff. God's already got it. He got this. We lose and sleep. On all kind of medication. Hair on fire. And God is saying, peace be still. He's already spoke peace into the situation. When we get a hint, hint, clue, clue, then we can start to re-operate uh, in the realm of reality. Not present-day physical reality, but heavenly realm reality that God is in control. But notice, I'm going to give you a couple of verses today. This was a widespread persecution of the church. 
Notice what the Bible says in verse number three. It says, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, hauling men and women, uh, committed them, committing them to prison. Notice that men and women, that's important. Because in those days, they said women were so insignificant uh, and mattered very little. But it stresses the point that everyone who in some way, shape, form, or fashion espouse Christianity, you can't escape the fury of this persecution. He says, yeah, men and women were drugged into jail, put into prison. Notice the persecution of the church. It started as a local uh, targeted thing, but quickly spread throughout the whole region. And, and not only did it spread throughout the region, they, they stormed into people's homes. Can you imagine having dinner? And then all of a sudden, they just kick your door in. Well, wait a minute, that sounds like today. What's that sister in, in Louisville? They just banged into her door in and just, Yana Taylor. This is, this is, this is becoming an everyday occurrence. Can you see the prophetic uh, uh, utterances here? We have to understand uh, that it's, we're just this far away from this happening in your house, in our community. And it's not just a racial thing. I'm just talking about a loveless thing. Just don't uh, disagree with me. Then you're on my list. And matter of fact, right now we're talking, they're, 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 they're heads of state talking about our main objection, objective is the annihilation of another state. We live and breathe for the purpose of making sure that someone else does not live and breathe. What happens when they begin to say that about Christians? For those who would name the name of Christ. He arrested all that he could find. He arrested them and, and threw men and women in prison. He stormed every synagogue, hunting them down, uh, and even in other cities. I'm going all over the place, trying to find these folk who are, uh, have the audacity uh, to be a part of this sect, or this cult called Christianity, even before it was called Christianity. At then, they were just called the way, you know, or that group, you know, the way. Are you of that way? <laughs> Notice, he brought many to their death and gave voice to the death of others. You know, he's the one, he may not go to the, what's the place? He may not go to the Capitol, but he'll whip everybody up so they go to the Capitol. Yes. Saul made havoc of the church. He was being used by Satan. Yes, yes he was. But here's the funny thing. He's being used by Satan to destroy the church while he thought he was being used by God to stamp out this heresy. Yet God did use him providentially. He used him providentially. It kind of reminds me of Moses uh, when he was put into that little basket. And Pharaoh had you know, put out an edict and an order and a decree uh, and mandated all those midwives, when you saw a male child being born, kill it, right? And as, and as he, he came home from the office of being Pharaoh, and he said, yeah, it was a hard day. You know, we, we killed all so many. I know we, stand, we, we found the one. We're going to kill him. And, you know, whew, I'm sitting down. I'm tired. Had a big day killing all them Hebrews, right? Bring my grandson in here so I can bounce him on my knee. How you doing, little Moses? How you been all day? Don't tell me God don't have a sense of humor. So God, is, he, he, he's, he's rocking on his knee. The very one who's going to destroy him and crush his power. Saul thought he was doing God a favor by stamping out the church, but God was using him to help the church to fulfill that mandate of going throughout the, all, the whole world. Yeah. Saul was a tool to be used by God. And it's also a testimony of the grace of God because it's very Saul who was breathing threatenings against the church. God would soon take him and capture his heart 
and turn him into a champion for the cause of Christ. Don't tell me God don't have a sense of humor. Yeah, yeah, he changed his whole, he, first of all, he, he changed his, his, his status, okay? In other words, he saved him. He gave him the message of salvation. Yeah, and when he went down, what was he going down to where? Um, was he going to uh, Damascus? Is that right? Um, Damascus? The folk down in Damascus heard that, that, that Saul was coming. And he said, oh, no, he, he, he found us. And they were afraid. And God told us, the preacher, <laughs> he said, he's coming. I want you to get ready. To, I want you to go meet him and, and share with him the faith. He said, are you sure you want me to do that? <laughs> Had one of the Richard Pryor moments. <laughs> Was that you, God? <laughs> For real? Yeah, yeah. I want you to preach to him. So God changed his status. He changed his heart. Change his, then, then he retooled his purpose. He retooled his purpose. He wanted to be a, 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 a tragedy to the church. He became the church's chief triumph. God can retool you. You got to stop running from God. And you got to go ahead and stop saying, well, you know, God, use me. Use me. I don't care who, everybody else can sit on down and do what you're going to do, but I want you to use me. And when you say use me, God and you make a majority. Saul became a champion of Christianity. Notice, they that were scattered, it went all about scattered abroad, running for their lives. The issue was not the persecution. Stay with me, because all we see is the persecution. So at the physical eye, we see the persecution, but the issue was not the persecution that was happening during the ministry, because the persecution was happening during the ministry of Jesus. They were always persecuting Jesus. Yeah, yeah. You've read your Bible. Yeah. They've always persecuted Jesus. They always try to trap Jesus. <clears throat> they always did something contrary to the cause of Christ. They even put him on a tree. Took his physical life. Did all that kind of stuff. When the apostles were preaching, they would drag him in before the Sanhedrin, uh, uh, before the, the court, and threaten him not to do it anymore. They even persecuted, whipped him, and beat him, and all that kind of stuff, right? Didn't stop him. And he got deeper and deeper and deeper. And now they have separated them physically. See, the real issue is this, not about the persecution. It's always going to happen. The real issue is how do you respond to the pressure Amen. of the persecution? That's the real issue. See, it's not about what happens to you. It's how you respond to it. And that's a universal principle that goes in life. How do you respond? When someone acts ugly toward you, do you respond by getting ugly as well? How do you respond to what happens to you? That begins to show who you are, your real metal. It will be tested. Either it may be, and sometimes we have light persecutions. But sometimes it can be hot and heavy. Notice, whatever persecution throws your way, you can handle it when you choose to put God first. Someone said when you put God first, you never come in second. Is that all right? So how are you going to deal with this? This is critical. You can't leave here today without an understanding. How are you going to respond in situations like this? This is a take your gloves off kind of thing now. Notice, God used evil, the evil of the world to scatter the gospel message. See, he, he took those with hatred in their hearts and he used them to scatter the message of love abroad. Believers were scattered 
and they took the gospel everywhere they went. Everywhere they went, they did not leave home without it. They took the gospel with them. They didn't have a whole bunch of books. The word was simply in their heart. The love of Christ was in their heart. So everywhere they went, they took the love of Christ, and they took the message. Notice the believers were scattered. It didn't say the apostles, did it? The apostles stayed in Jerusalem. And have you ever wondered why? Why did the apostles seem like they should have been on the 10, the, the, 10, the 12 most wanted list, right? Yeah. But they stayed there in Jerusalem. What a display of courage. What a display of being sold out for the cause of Christ. It was essential that they stay there. Because all those people who were scattered, guess what they had to do? They had to look with assurance to the fact that they're in the church. We in the church. They're, we may not have it right here in this little podunk place we're in, but in Jerusalem, we have a church. Yes. It was vitally important that the church survive, that the church maintain strength, that they become the, 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 the city on the hill, that all other believers who were now scattered could still look to Jerusalem because that's where the church is. It's important that the church survive. The apostles stayed, but guess what? The majority of the evangelistic work was not done by the preacher. It was not done by uh, the apostles. It was done by those who were scattered. Yeah. I want to talk about the acts of the scattered church today. See, it was the scattered church uh, that evangelized the world. It was the scattered church that took the gospel every place. They went everywhere gossiping the good news of the gospel. Those were the, quote, we would call them lay, lay members, lay folk, pew packers. They had Christ in their hearts. And everywhere they went, they went forth. Believers were scattered. And they took the gospel everywhere they went. They were not the clergy. I'm using these words that we often use. You know, we they didn't have those words. Uh, we use the word the clergy versus the laity, making some kind of divide. Okay, making some kind of divide so those who are in one rank will kind of look at themselves as being better than those at the other rank. See, we get caught up in that nonsense. <clears throat> A lot of times people uh, meet me and they know me as Gino. And I got this from a guy by the name of Richard Rogers. He was one of my one of, my, um, uh, one of my professors at the Sunset International Bible Institute. And he would say he would go to a certain place and he would get a part-time job. So when people ask him what he does for a living, he could talk about that job and never tell them about he was a preacher. Never tell them about, you know, I'm pastor so-and-so or I'm reverend so-and-so. I'm brother this, or I'm brother that. No, my name is Gino Murray. Well, how you do? And you can talk smack to me and, and all that cussing, all that kind of stuff. Be who you are. Because I'm going to be who I am. Let's, let's just dispense with all the titles and all that kind of stuff. Now, if you, you know, want to give credit to a person and, you know, there are appropriate places for certain things. I get that. But I want to talk to you on a heart level today. We have to dispense with a lot of all that kind of stuff and get down to the real business of how we're going to get the job done. The apostles stayed in Jerusalem and all those lay people were scattered and they took the gospel message to the world. Yeah. All lay members are to scatter the gospel. See, that's why I love this one, uh, just one more campaign. It puts the onus on us where God always wanted it to be. Remember over in Ephesians chapter 4, we alluded to it earlier. I'm going to kind of expand on it for just a second. You know, he says that uh, these gifts to the church, the prophets and the apostles and the evangelists and pastor teachers and all that kind of stuff, were given as gifts to the church for a purpose. Look at the, um, look at the preposition, for. For the equipping of the saints. Why are the saints equipped? Preposition for. For the work of service. Why? for the church being built together, fitly framed together, that we may mature. That's what this is about. 
And so therefore now the, 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 uh, the membership, God used the persecution to embolden the saints to service. They ran, but they did not hide. That which was in them had to come out of them. It kind of reminds me of Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah had a different circumstance. Jeremiah was kind of fed up. He said, you know what? I've been preaching to everybody. And everybody get, I got 100% response. <laughs> everybody said no. <laughs> right? And he said, I'm tired. You know, I'm, I'm, get, I'm, I'm, I'm hanging this stuff up. And he said, when I say that I will no longer, you know, speak in his name, I'm, I'm not going to speak or preach anymore. He says, uh, it becomes like a burning fire shut up within my bones. He said, I'm weary of trying to contain. I can't keep it in. And when they got scattered abroad, that which was on the inside had to come out. They couldn't just contain themselves. They had to speak and preach and gossip the good news. How about us? Will you even give out an invitation? Perhaps God has to send us persecution. What's in your heart? What's in your heart? Is the fact that God has loved you and saved you, is that flooding your heart? Does it fill your soul to the point that you are just uh, so overwhelmed by the love of God that you can't help yourself? You become a George Cabell. Right? Just, just, just everybody I see, you know, I'm chasing folk down <laughs> to tell them about Jesus. Yeah, he get on folk nerve a lot. And so don't worry about that. Sometimes that can be a badge of honor. Don't get me started. <laughs> I'm just trying to say, you know, I ain't mad at the brother. You know, now, brother, now sometimes you need to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. Right? Know when to walk away and when to run. I, we all have to, but that's a part of our a maturing process. But these people, everywhere they went, they went gossiping the good news. I'm not going to deal with verses 6, 7, and 8. That's just a, that gave you a, 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 a microcosm, a microspection of one person, you know, Philip. But I venture to say that there was a lot of Philip scenarios going on all over the place. They isolate Philip. As he dealt with, you know, different circumstances, uh, Simon the sorcerer, uh, the eunuch from Ethiopia, and all that kind of stuff. Those are just snapshots of what was going on at large. Because all of them went out gossiping the good news. You see what I'm saying? The, the thing I want you to get that, even that when there was persecution, while there was persecution, uh, the Bible says uh, there was preaching, it went all over the place. Even though there was Persecution, verse 8 says, there was great joy in that city. Whenever we begin to preach the good news of Jesus Christ, uh, unashamedly, uh, with no hesitancy, uh, you know, in Matthew chapter 10, uh, 10 and 32, but before you even get there, he said, many people are going to hate you. Many people are going to be against you. Many people are going to try to douse your flame. Many people are going to threaten you. They're going to uh, put all kinds of uh, 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 reprisals against you and you know, try to muffle your, 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 your voice. He said, don't even worry about none of that. He said, don't be ashamed to speak my name. Right? So he tells his disciples, he tells his followers, he tells those who he would give them the great commission. He said, if you are ashamed of me uh, before men, then I'll be ashamed of you before my father. If you confess me before men, I'm talking to my folk now. I know we use that passage to tell people they got to come in and, and, and use this confession. We, I, I get that. But this text is talking about us, you and I, who claim to love God, to get out there and proclaim and confess his name unashamedly. Don't be ashamed to uh, profess him and confess him and preach his name. And don't be ashamed because if you are ashamed to uh, confess me before men, well, then I'll be ashamed to confess you before my father. The great purpose of the persecution was to spread the gospel throughout the world as Christ had commanded. <laughs> you see how God got the job done? 
even sometimes we may be reluctant, God can still get the job done. He will get the job done, whether he uses you or somebody else. It's up to the staunch, faithful endurance of the believer. Most preaching and witnessing was to be done not by the apostles, in other words, not by the preacher, but by the scattered lay believers. And I think we as a church, and I like that, I think we are in harmony with the will of God when we say that we are here to glorify God through serving others and make every member a minister that we may do what? That we, the members, may take his message to the masses. Point blank, period. That's what this thing is all about. And the question is, if you're here today and you have gotten clouded by some, some uh, uh, notion that is all about getting a hired gun to do all the preaching and evangelizing, no, the hired gun is, is, is there for one purpose, for the equipping of the saints. That the saints, the equipped saints now can engage in works of service uh, based on love. And if you don't do it, he'll send a persecution and make you get to it. That's what it's all about. I ain't, I, <laughs> no whole bar. That's a book. We see it in Acts chapter 8. God said go, and we said we want to stay. He said, you going to go. Uh-huh. How you like me now? And then he's in some persecution. He turned up the heat. He turned up the heat. And when the heat got turned up, then they began to do what they were already supposed to be doing. I'm through, guys. <laughs> if you're here today, God loves you. Just like he, 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 tamed, he changed and repurposed Saul. Yeah, gave him his, 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 his Roman name, Paul, and began to affect the turning of the world upside down for the cause of Christ. How about you? Can God use you? Or the question is, are you willing to be a vessel to be used by God? Just you and God make a majority. If you're, if you're not a member of the body of Christ, well, you need to be. Not going to song and dance this thing. If you if you are lost in sin, there is a solution to your sin problem, and it's in the Messiah. Right. Yeah, Jesus says, "If I be lifted up, I draw all men unto me." And that's what our job is to do as a church: exalt the character of Christ in our living and proclaim the message of Christ in our going. Amen. Nothing can stop us when we do what God wants us to do by saying, "Yes, I believe that Jesus is the Christ." He's the Messiah. He was Emmanuel. In other words, God uh, tabernacled or pitched his tent among us through Jesus. And Jesus gave himself sacrificially. And he was buried and he rose again the third day. The Bible said he was declared to be the son of God with power, how by the resurrection of the dead. So all we need to do is say, yes, I want to turn away from that old wicked world. I want to now turn to Christ. We call that repentance in the church and stained glass words. But the bottom line, I'm turning from that life into another life. I want to now live for God. Confess him as Lord. I'm submitting to his lordship. And I'm willing to be buried in the watery grave of baptism for the remission of my sins. And now let's get this thing going. And begin to share with others. You may not know everything. You may not have all your eyes dotted and T's crossed, but you can speak of the love of God. Amen. And God says, I got you. I'll be with you always, even until the end of the age. Think about it. That is together. We stand and sing a song of encouragement. We invite your response. Mm -hmm.